Hello and welcome back to Industry Broadcast Audio Article number 59, made possible as always by IndustryBroadcast.com, bringing the collective insight of the gaming industry to your ears. Audio Article number 59 was written by Yours Dormans. Yours is a lecturer of New Media Theory and Game Design at Avon's College Breda, and is currently a lecturer of Game Design, Human Centered Design, and Interactive Narrative at Hog School van Amsterdam. On top of his academic life, he is also an independent game designer of the digital as well as traditional variety. To check out more of his articles, book reviews, and a rundown on what projects he has on the go right now, we recommend that you head over to Yours Dormans, that's J O R I S D O R M A N S dot N L. Audio article number 59, titled Lost in a Forest. Finding New Paths for Narrative Gaming, written by Yours Dormans and read aloud by Ryan Wienko on the 15th of January, 2009. Branching plot trees are the dominant form in popular conception of interactive fiction or interactive cinema. In this form of interactive storytelling, the reader or player occasionally chooses a direction for the story to develop in from a set of pre-designed options. Many computer games are plot trees. The landscape of computer-mediated narrative games is like a forest. However, the plot tree constitutes a rather poor strategy of storytelling and gaming alike. A plot tree offers little control over the story and forces choice between a distinct number of options that does not inspire significant action on the part of the player. This contributes to a mechanical and lifeless story effect. Worse still, the player is pulled out of the narrative world to make an often arbitrary choice and left to wonder whether the story might have been better if she had chosen differently. As Stephen Poole puts it, we don't want to have to make crucial narrative decisions that might, in effect, spoil the story for us. We want to have our cake and eat it too. In this paper, I will explore alternative structures of narrative gaming drawing on the accumulated experience of pen and paper role-playing games and expanding on more hypothetical structures of the fractal story. It is due time we cut those fictional trees down. Narrative Games Rule-based simulation of a world is what sets games apart from hypertext and many other media that do not allow some forms of interaction. Interaction and simulation in games are closely tied to a notion of dynamic systems and emergent behavior. Media of these types allow for a type of experimental and culturally significant form of play, or PEDA. It might well be, as Frasca has put it, that video games imply an enormous paradigm shift for our culture because it represents the first complex simulational media for the masses. Thus, in order to understand games, we must comprehend the rhetoric particular simulation. We must understand how game and simulation rules structure our experience, how we interact with the gaming mechanics and enter into the cybernetic feedback loop that can consume our attention for hours on end. Not all of these game engines have a disposition to generate narrative output, but some unquestionably have. These are narrative games. Pen and paper role-playing games are precursors of computer-based narrative games, even though, strictly speaking, computer games are little older than these role-playing games. For their entire 30-year history, pen and paper role-playing games have had the advantage of little technological limitations and have had access to the most powerful processor available, that being the human mind. This has given pen and paper role-playing games a clear advantage over computer-mediated narrative games. This has led to the development of different types of structures for interactive storytelling, but also has allowed these games to make much more of the interaction between the player and the game. As we shall see, it is the freedom of the player's expression on one hand, and the cooperation between players and storytellers on the other that makes these games so successful. There is no reason why computer games can't make use of the same recipe. By reinvestigating possible ways of structuring interactive stories, and by giving more attention to the ways players may express themselves, we might discover a way out of the forest, 
and discover new horizons for narrative gaming. We like to think about games as cybertexts, but from the point of view of pen and paper role players, the interaction in computer games remains rather limited. To them, these games are little better than spreadsheets with nice, pretty textures. Character builders associated with role playing games instead of role playing games. For many players, expression and interaction has always been the strength of narrative gaming. As Stephen Poole argues, the technology is keeping back the development of interactive narratives. We simply do not have the technology to allow for more than a handful of dialogue options. The result is that the contribution of the player to the construction of the game consists only of the options that can be selected using a mere handful of buttons. We might have to wait for the development of good speech synthesizing, voice recognition, and natural language parsing before the games industry starts delivering dramatic game interaction, but we might as well be waiting forever. However, there are games that do offer more ways of expression to the player. According to Harvey Smith, lead designer of Deus Ex, the game tried to provide the player with a host of player expression tools and then turn them loose in an immersive atmospheric environment. The expressions Smith talks about are extremely limited on the first glance. The player, for example, is offered the chance to choose between two different upgrades for his avatar. But because these upgrades are tied into analog systems such as lighting or sound, they continue to influence the game and thus offer a finer granularity of expression that most branching path models never could. In Deus Ex, the way you develop your avatar became an important tool for expression. In the end, it determines the way you play the game, and this development is firmly rooted in the narrative background. In many ways, Shigeru Miyamoto advocates a same approach to game development when he stated that another big element is the player themselves can grow. In the game, you see and feel Link actually grow. At the same time, the player can become better players. This prompted game designer Doug Church to state in a discussion on Mario 64 that, simple though the controls are, they are very expressive, allowing rich interaction between simple movement and a small selection of jumping moves. From a semiotic or linguistic point of view, the limited number of signs a player can use does not necessarily limit the number of expressions that can be built from them. In fact, a defining characteristic of language prevalent throughout all linguistic work of Noam Chomsky is that we make infinite use of finite means. Although the number of words in a language is much larger than the number of commands in a computer game, Chomsky illustrates how this infinite use of finite means can be achieved with only a few words. Likewise, semiotics, as a theory of signs, is not only interested in the way signifiers relate to signifiers, but also the way several signs combine on a syntactic axis. The expressive potential of the limited input is hardly exhausted by the common dialogue trees. When limited commands are projected onto the world simulation, as is the case in Deus Ex or Mario 64, their potential as tools for dramatic expression increases. Railroads and Story Worlds Dungeons and Dragons is not really known for its strong plots or dramatic developments. Originally, the game was designed around dungeon adventures, where the player had to explore a dungeon, kill monsters, and find the treasure. At the basis of these adventures is not a set of possible scenes, but a map that outlines the dungeon. The map has been prepared in advance, or is taken from a commercial adventure module. The map provides details on the whereabouts of different monsters, secret doors, various pits, and pendulums. The map gives the player the freedom to explore, while at the same time it limits the game within natural boundaries. The existence of the prepared map contributes to the freedom by providing an easy and fair method reference to the storyteller or dungeon master. It conveys the idea that the players can truly choose their own path and destiny, contributing to a sense of agency on the part of the player. On the other hand, the players cannot escape the dungeon. There is usually no reason for the storyteller to prepare anything outside of the dungeon. The map allows her to focus on the actions of the players within its confines. It helps her prepare the game, 
Players are unlikely to go beyond the limits of the dungeon, because after all, the whole point of playing Dungeons & Dragons is to explore the dungeon, slay the monster, and steal the treasure. Role-playing games have evolved from their dungeon-crawling beginnings, but still maps are the backbone of many ongoing stories. The map is a way of simulating a world. Designing a map sets up a web of possibilities for the players to explore. The old dungeon adventures are crude and primitive compared to the worlds and settings created for later games. These elaborate settings define the narrative disposition of the game. By setting up an intricate simulation rife with dramatic potential, they have become story worlds. Even in those instances where a political or psychological map forms its most defining structure. The downside of the story world is that players can easily become lost in their sheer size. In most computer role-playing games that rely on huge maps, the action quickly becomes repetitive. How many dungeons should one visit to gain enough experience points to be able to deal with the next part of the story? For players interested in the hack-and-slash combat, these games invariably offer that is fine, but those who wish to progress the story can find it an arduous task, and may lose track of or interest in the narrative altogether. These are the reason for Chris Crawford not to put too much hope in this structure. One other way to overcome the restrictions of the plot tree is to abandon the idea of player choice altogether and drive her through a single plot narrative. Design effort can then be directed and delivered on evolving a story and keeping up the illusion of freedom of action. For in the end, in most games, freedom is just that, an illusion. It is a strategy that is common in printed adventure modules for role-playing games. In effect, the player may control her avatar, and the player's actions may be crucial to help story advance, but the story is typically constructed in a way that it will advance independent of the player's relative success. In role-playing, this structure is often referred to as railroading. The trick of good railroaded story is to either put the player under the illusion that they are doing it all themselves, or have the plot motivate their lack of control over the situation. Usually a combination of the two works best. Many computer games that have been credited for having a good story make extensive use of the rail. A good example is Half-Life, not only because actual trains feature prominently in the game, but that the survivalist narrative that drives the game makes sure the player always has a clear goal. Escape the vast Black Mesa complex. As the player progresses through the various levels, the story of the technological failure and subsequent government cover-up takes form as you overhear guards, marines, and scientists that are there to put you on your path. In Half-Life, you either advance through the levels or you die. There are no options. There are two distinctive dangers of the railroading stories. First, the player may get frustrated when she feels that she has lost control. And second, the player may get the feeling that her action does not matter at all, that she plays only a small part in the story as it develops. In both cases, the player's feeling of immersive agency crumbles, and she might as well read a book, watch a movie, or go see a play. The agency we have in railroading stories is micro-agency, to use Doug Church's word, and what it is lacking is agency at a higher level. Fractal Stories The term fractal story is coined by Marie Laura Ryan in her discussion of Neil Stephenson's novel The Diamond Age. With Ryan, I think that the fractal story is an interesting direction in which interactive storytelling and narrative gaming might evolve. In Stephenson's work of science fiction, a lower-class girl called Nell, by chance, acquires a state-of-the-art interactive book. The book is designed to educate little girls, teaching her all manners of practical skill and preparing her for the world at large. It does so by relating the adventures of Princess Nell. These adventures are partly interactive. Sometimes Nell has to decide what Princess Nell is going to do. The stories of Princess Nell take the form of classic folktales. When Nell has become an experienced reader of the book, she understands the basic premise of these stories and thereby understands what is expected of Princess Nell. But the book has prepared Nell also by telling her the end of the story might be the beginning. While Nell is reading the book, she is not advancing the story, rather than she is expanding it. 
where once the book simply referred to the many adventures Princess Nell has had in the land of the Twelve Fairy Kings, they grow into full-blown interactive stories for Nell to enjoy and resolve, when those parts are read more closely by simply flipping back the pages and starting again. It is this ability to zoom in on a story that gives the structure its name. And Fractious with Stephenson, and Fractal by Ryan. In my opinion, the fact that basic structure is known and recognized by the reader is at least as important for the fractal story structure. It is a point that is stressed by the Diamond Age. We change the script a little, Madame Ping said, to allow for cultural differences. But the story never changes. There are many people and many tribes, but only so many stories. The narrative database the interactive book uses is filled with generic universal folk material. These are meant to be recognizable. This is also in line with the chosen metaphor of the mathematical structure of the fractal. For one of the characteristics of fractals in nature is that we are very good at recognizing them. A coastline is fractal, but not every fractal line qualifies as a coastline. To draw an imaginary and convincing coastline takes some practice. The same goes for folktales. Most people will recognize a folktale quickly by reading it in just a few lines. It is the particular use of words, content matter, and style that makes the genre recognizable. When the story is recognized as a folktale, certain expectations about its narrative structure can be made. Folktales have particular and predictable ways of developing an ending. However, this does not harm the pleasure of reading such stories in any way. In fact, these aspects of storytelling goes for a great many of genres. We like to believe that we watch films or read books exactly because we do not know how the story will end. But this is only partly true. We often know that the hero is not going to die. Fans of horror films will often be able to make accurate guesses of who will live or die after only a few minutes. After all, it cannot possibly be the right course of action in a Hollywood blockbuster if it wipes out the stars. We often end up retelling the same story. It is not the plot that matters much, it is the process of telling that makes it worthwhile. As Atkins puts it, the satisfaction of such stories, at least at the level of discrete plot fragments, rests not in matter of plot sophistication, but in matters of sophistication of telling. The question is never will the prince overcome the dragon, but how will the prince overcome the dragon? The retelling of old, mythical, biblical stories is often applauded in literature, drama, and cinema. Why shouldn't it be good enough for games? Especially as games are particularly good at creating tales tailored to the taste of the individual player, giving such a tale much more personal significance. Working towards a predefined, if not pre-designed, goal is a common strategy amongst those role players that design their own stories. Knowledge of the fantasy genre will help the players to guess the general shape of the story. In fact, the Lord of the Rings help shape many fantasy adventures to the extent that finding a particular artifact or finding out how to deal with it has become a very common structure in many role-playing adventures. As long as the storyteller and the player subconsciously work towards the same goal, such a goal confines the game as effectively as a map in a story world. The basic structure of the quest, where not the goal, but the path towards it is the biggest beneficiary of the hero, is highly compatible with this structure. The idea behind the fractal story can solve some problems of interactive narratives. It has often been argued that a good story depends on authorial control which cannot be combined with the freedom of action. The structure of narrative storytelling discussed above cannot solve this dilemma entirely, the plot tree is too restrictive, the story world often lacks strong narrative development, and the rail quickly turns into a frustrating experience when the illusion of freedom is broken. The fractal story can be seen, to some extent, as taking a position somewhere between the story world and the rail. Like the rail, it has a fixed destination, although its destination is less defined, but unlike the rail, the path towards the goal is not fixed. Like the story world, it offers freedom to the players, but its boundaries are not determined by the edges of a map, but by a common goal and direction. Most likely the destination of a story is defined by the conventions of the genre. 
In a fantasy setting, we expect the protagonists to be heroes, and since most of them do not start out as one, it is the path of becoming a hero that is the true story being told. The very extreme form is the imminent death of the hero in a classic tragedy. A common destination of the story is the only one we can truly blur the boundaries between reader and author in narrative games, and this becomes a lot easier when the player knows what is expected and the storyteller knows what the player expects. Likewise, the plot structure is known beforehand. Players can experiment with different motivations that drive the plot forward. It makes it easier for the storyteller to allow the player to create those well-turned phrases and elegant sentences as well. Still, the destination of a fractal story can be reached under different conditions, changing the relevance or meaning of the destination dramatically. The film Hero offers a good illustration of this point. In Hero, the same story is told again and again. The climax of the story is always the same, a duel between the nameless hero and a character called Flying Snow. However, because the events leading up to the scene change a little with each telling, the emotion that drives the scene changes, from jealousy to love and honor, giving the scene a new poetic significance with each iteration. Stories thus constructed have the power to change one's perception of certain events by offering multiple viewpoints, which would be high on my list of functions of literature or art in general. Games can do this as well. It allows a player to approach the same story from different angles by replaying, or these different perspectives can be incorporated in a game in different episodes. Imagine a game where you were required to kill a certain antagonist, and then in the next sentence, playing the role of the antagonist through the events that build up to his death. One basis on which the fractal story works is that most interactive storytelling is a cooperative activity. The story is confined by the self-set peta rules, or laws of drama, that set the story's style and genre. Most players are prepared to work with each other, the game master or game taking the latter's lead. Just as a good game master or game takes care to involve all of the players and to give them what they want, this does not necessarily mean that she should be easy on the players, only that she is to provide the type of fun that they all agreed on by playing a particular game, whether it is a quasi-mythical heroes of high fantasy or the gothic horror of playing modern-day vampires. Players and storytellers strive after closely aligned goals, the creation of interesting narrative game experiences. Game designers should do well to design a story so that it progresses to a fixed point, but allows the player enough freedom of expression to breathe life into the story and change it into a personal and significant tale. However, this is also the weakness of the fractal story. No real contract is signed by the players or the storyteller. Sometimes players will have different ideas of what is expected from them, Sometimes storytellers cannot adjust to the wishes of his or her players. In a game set in the Star Wars universe, the kinesthetic pleasures of the deep space chase might be the essential aspect for the player. But if the storyteller only wants to expand on the quasi-mystical theories of the Jedi tradition, their expectations might conflict. Likewise, playing a deranged vampire who thinks that his character is in a cartoon because he is immortal and insists on smashing everything with an oversized hammer, could be fun to some. But it can also harm a carefully prepared campaign about the dark romantic love between a mortal and a vampire. Conclusion Plot trees are restrictive modes of interactive storytelling. Narrative games which combine simulation of a narrative game world with a significant way of player expression are much more successful modes of storytelling. Player expression can be limited to only a few commands, as long as the ways these commands can be combined and interact with a simulated world can accommodate a certain level of complexity. In such games, players are stimulated to immerse themselves into a gaming world. The fractal world combines the strengths of two common and successful types of interactive stories, the story world and the railroading story. Assuming that the players and the storyteller are cooperating in creating a compelling story, we can use that knowledge to structure the game and focus the narrative development.
In such games, it is not a casual plot that drives the story, but the expression and significance particular players bring to it. For computer games, this means that they can deliver a good story as long as they give the player room to contribute to it. Narrative depth in such games does not depend on having different endings, but on the quality and variety of expressions that can emerge from each individual's play. This concludes audio article number 59, once again written by Yours Dormans, whose blog can be found at www.yoursdormans.nl. As always, we recommend that you check back frequently to industrybroadcast.com as we